So first off, I'd like to commend my subscribers for the great questions you guys have been asking me by way of email. I want, I want you guys to understand that those emails are not just about you guys receiving the information you need. It's also been a huge help in my own personal sanctification. So thank you all. Now, we have an email from one of my subscribers who goes by the name of Cordell from South Africa. And he writes, I was wondering if you could please help me understand Matthew 721. I think it's pretty straightforward on the surface, but the more I think about it, the more I get bothered by it. Or should I say, it gives me a lot of sleepless nights. I know we're not saved by works, but what does, but only, uh, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is at in heaven mean? I always wonder if, it, if there is a litmus test, apart from the fruit of the Spirit, I could perform on myself to check if I am truly saved. I'm seriously afraid of thinking that I'm a real follower only to be rejected by their Lord one day. Now, that is an amazing question. So thank you, Cordell. So let's tackle the verse. Matthew 7, 21 reads, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So if we look at the direction the Lord is headed in regards to the Sermon on the Mount, which encompasses Matthew 5 through 7, beginning in verse 13, Jesus discourses at length on the subject of true faith versus false professions. Using this technique of con contrast and comparison, verses 13 to 14 describe two paths on which people walk through life, the broad road that leads to eternal destruction and the narrow path that leads to eternal life. Now, in regards to Matthew 7, 21, the Lord is making it clear that a profession of faith means absolutely nothing. So what does profess something mean? So what does it mean to profess something? In a biblical sense, it's to claim or to affirm one's faith in a particular religion. When someone professes that they are a Christian or that Jesus is Lord of their life, the Lord in Matthew 7, 21 makes it clear that that doesn't mean anything. What matters is the Lord. What matters to the Lord is the fruit that is produced by way of said profession. This is why James 2.17 makes it clear that faith without works is dead. True faith produces works indicative of a biblical repentance. Now here's the confusing part. We are not saved by our works. We are saved by faith alone, Ephesians 2. But if you don't possess works, you don't get to heaven because works legitimize your faith. So what I want to do is use a well-known false teacher as an example. I'm going to play a clip of Francis Chan addressing Matthew 7.21 and then contradicting his profession by preaching damnable heresy after. So we're going to play the clip and then I'm going to talk after. The verse that got me into ministry was Matthew 7.21, where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And I thought, wow, not everyone that is going to say, oh, Jesus, you're my Lord. Because not everyone's going to do that. There's, there's those who are real. And there's others, he says, they'll spit you out of their mouth. He died so that my soul could be cleansed, so that my body could become completely clean, so that His Holy Spirit would enter into me. This is going in a weird direction. And just like I wouldn't dare ever refer to Jesus as just an ordinary guy. None of us would. Like, are you kidding me? He was a man and somehow he was God all at once. You can't call him ordinary. But don't you understand? That's what he's saying about us now. What? I am not God in human flesh. Neither are you. Being indwelled by the Holy Spirit is not a concept that is synonymous with the incarnation of the Son of God. This is, this is a version of the little God's doctrine here. Wow! I'm back in this blasphemy up. Somehow he was God all at once. You can't call him ordinary. But don't you understand? That's what he's saying about us now. Like right now, you're looking at a person who is not just a person. What are you exactly then? Somehow, God is in me, and there's a sense in which I am like God and man all at once. You were made for such a time as this, Francis, man. You're going to go do something special in Hong Kong. I can... 
clearly see it. This is blasphemy. I, I mean, this kind of harkens back to the uh, back to the Garden of Eden, you know, the temptation of the serpent telling the woman, yeah, yeah, when you eat of this, you're going to be like God. Yeah, this, yeah, this is this is not Christian sanctification. This is not a proper understanding of good works. Like I said, this is a catechism into narcissism and borders on, if, if not crosses the border into uh, this concept that you're a little deity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a mess. So now let's look back over Cordell's email and answer the final part of his question. His email reads, I always wondered if there's a litmus test. And this is the final part of his email. He reads, I always wondered if there's a litmus test. Apart from the fruit of the spirit, I can perform on myself to check to see if I am truly saved. I'm seriously afraid of thinking that I'm a real follower only to be rejected by the Lord one day. So Cordell is referring to biblical assurance. How do you know that your faith is real? How can you test to see if the faith you profess to have is actually of God? Now, the most important thing to understand about regeneration is this. When it happens, the Holy Spirit indwells you, literally. Let's read what the Lord says in Ezekiel 36, 26. He says, I will give you a new heart and put my spirit, the Holy Spirit, within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgment, judgments and do them. When a sinner is supernaturally regenerated by the Holy Spirit, not only do, do your desires change, they become godly. And that produces a change in your relationship to sin. The word of God and the people of God. Okay, let me say that again. That produces a change in your relationship to sin, the word of God, and the people of God. The sin you once loved, you now hate. As the Christian begins to grow and mature through sanctification, how do we grow? Here's the question. How do we grow? We grow through the reading or hearing of the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Your relationship to sin changes. It has to. You now have the Holy Spirit within you. This is not up for debate. This is not a question of whether or not this is true or not. This is what happens. This is a literal fact. Okay. If God saves you, you are changed. You are going to change. If I ask you, now this is important. I want you guys to listen clearly. Listen carefully. If I ask you, two years into your profession of faith, tell me about your life before Christ and now your life after conversion. Tell me about the changes that have taken place in your life. If you can't point out to me literal changes, you were never saved. OK, if you can't talk to me about your life before Christ and your life after regeneration, if you can't point out the differences and the changes, it's because you haven't truly been saved. That changed life is the work that the Lord is talking about in Matthew 7, 21. Because what you need to understand in the words of Jesus, that that what comes out of our mouth is of very little value with regard to our profession of faith, because he says many will come before me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Let me give you an example. I'm from America. I know nothing about soccer. So I tell you, I'm a football player. I'm a soccer player. And you go, really? Tell me about the game. I don't know anything about it. Tell me about the rules. Got me there. Show me how you can kick a ball. And I try to kick it and fall down. And you look at me and you go, you're no soccer player. Use the same logic with Christianity. My dear friend, there are all sorts of things going on in this world today in the name of Jesus Christ that have absolutely nothing to do with the name of Jesus Christ. And there are a lot of people claiming relationship with Jesus Christ that have no relationship whatsoever with Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, if there is a devil, and there is, and he is the enemy of Christianity, isn't it the wisest thing he could do? is to raise up a group of people who call themselves Christians, though they live like the devil. And that has happened, my friends. But remember this. You will find no excuse on the day of judgment by pointing to other condemned people who claim to belong to Jesus. Because the person you have to deal with is not them. It's Jesus Christ himself. Who is he? You see, you only have Three options. He's a liar. Because he said he was the son of God and he knew he wasn't. That's a liar. Or he's a lunatic. 
He said he was the son of God because he sincerely believed he was the son of God. But anyone who says that and believes that and is not the son of God is a lunatic. As C.S. Lewis said, on the level of a poached egg. Or he's Lord. And if he's Lord. Then he is the one with whom you must deal. 